in almost every culture and in almost every religion throughout the world, there has always been and there continues to be the belief that there is life after death, that there is there's something more, that there is something else beyond the grave. And this is not just wishful thinking on our part, because we're told in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11, that God has set eternity in our hearts. And then, though some people attempt to deny this fact, and they deny it because then they would be accountable to God, well, still, this is the hope that we have, a hope that lies deep within us, a hope that is shared by many different people from many different backgrounds around the world. And in the Bible, which is the word of God, in the Old Testament, as well as in the New Testament, this hope is reflected in the words of the prophets who wrote down what God said about our resurrection from the dead. For example, in Psalm 49 and in Psalm 73, the psalmists expressed their confidence in God when they said this. God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave. He will guide me and he will receive me into glory. And it was Job who firmly asserted his belief in the resurrection when he said this in Job chapter 19. As for me, I know that my redeemer lives. And at the last, he will take his stand upon this earth. And even after my body is destroyed in my flesh, I will see God. But in what is perhaps the clearest teaching concerning the resurrection from the dead that is found in the Old Testament, the prophet Daniel said this in Daniel chapter 12. Those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake, some to everlasting life and others to everlasting shame. And though this teaching is clear, still, not everyone in the nation of Israel who lived at the time of Jesus believed in the resurrection of the dead. And among them, there was a small, but a powerful group of men who were known as the Sadducees. These were the opponents of the Pharisees. And the Sadducees were in control of the temple. And they were the ones who occupied the places of prom prominence among the leaders of the nation of Israel. These were the ones who were the wealthy elite. And throughout the ministry of Jesus, the Sadducees had not shown very much interest in, interest in Jesus. Uh, they were more concerned about other things. They were more concerned about making money. They were more concerned about maintaining their political power and their control in the nation. And they thought that Jesus really posed no, no threat to them. And though they were Jewish... They had aligned themselves with the Roman government, who allowed them to, to profit greatly from their influence in the nation of Israel. Like many people today, the Sadducees filled their lives with things that benefited them. But here, in Matthew chapter 22, we find them coming to Jesus in an attempt to humiliate him in the eyes of the people. But why? Why, why now, at the end of the ministry of Jesus? 
Well, you'll recall that on the day before they came to him, Jesus had removed the businesses from the temple courtyard that were exploiting the people and were disgracing God. And the Sadducees were the ones who were profiting from those businesses. And so this hit them right where it hurt. It hit them in their wallet. And the triumphal entry of Jesus into the city of Jerusalem and his popularity with the people who were calling him a king, oh, well, that really got their attention because the Romans might come down hard on the nation of Israel thinking that Jesus was about to lead a rebellion against them. And so the Sadducees might lose their position of power. They might lose their wealth. They might lose everything. So when the followers of the Pharisees and the Herodians fail to discredit Jesus, it was in their best interest to try and bring him down. And so they publicly approached him in the temple courtyard while he was teaching the people the word of God. And they spoke to him about their favorite subject. And their favorite subject was this. It was what they saw as a lack of biblical evidence that there is a resurrection from the dead for anybody. But after hearing the words of the psalmist and after hearing uh, the words of Job and of Daniel, well, we might wonder why they could believe that. Well, the Sadducees believe that only the first five books of the Bible, which were written by Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, were inspired by God. They believed that, but they believed that all the other books in the Old Testament were just commentaries on those first five books. They only accepted the words of Moses as the word of God. And they could find no place where Moses spoke of the resurrection from the dead. So they thought that they could silence Jesus because he did speak of the resurrection in his teaching. And though these Sadducees differed from all the other leaders in the nation of Israel on many things, they did have this one thing in common with them. They wanted to kill Jesus as well. And so it says in verse 23 of Matthew chapter 22, on that day, some Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection from the dead, came to Jesus. And they questioned him, thinking that they had a question that he could not answer. And they said this to him in verse 24. Teacher, didaskalos in Greek, greatly admired instructor of the word of God, Deuteronomy chapter 25, in, in that book, Moses, the great lawgiver and the spokesman for God, said this. If a man dies having no children, well, then his unmarried brother, as the next of kin, shall marry his wife, his widow, and he shall raise up offspring, technam, a child. He'll raise up a child to carry on the name of his brother, which you may recall is how Ruth married Boaz, as it was presented in Ruth chapter 4. And so this was a common custom that was well known to everyone in the nation of Israel. It was a custom that is also found in other cultures as well, and it is called a leveret marriage, which... Uh, in Latin, means uh, brother-in-law. And so this was God's provision. Provision to perpetuate 
the family name, uh, to perpetuate and continue the heritage of that family. And so this custom, which was spoken about by Moses to the, fa to the Sadducees, illustrated the irrationality of the resurrection of the dead. How so? Well, they related a story to Jesus. Uh, and in this story, they attempted to prove their point. And whether, whether it was an actual account of something that actually happened, or it was just a story that they constructed in order to serve as an example, we don't know. But they started their story in verse 25, and they said this. Now, there were seven brothers who were among us. And the first brother married a wife. But sadly, he died. And having no, no offspring, no children, no children by that woman, no heir to carry on his name, according to the law of Moses, he left his wife to his unmarried brother. So, this second brother married her, uh, but once again, tragedy struck that family, and the second brother also died. And amazingly, the third as well, right down to the seventh brother. They all married her, and they all died. And last of all, the woman died as well. That's the story. Well, now, the question in verse 28 by the Sadducees to Jesus is this. In the resurrection, if there is a resurrection at all, as you claim there is, whose wife of the seven shall she be? For they all had her as their wife. And, you know, this is the kind of question uh, that would have silenced the, the Pharisees. Why? Because they believed that our earthly relationships continue on into eternity. And how could you sort out these relationships in this story, in this situation? But we're told, verse 29, that Jesus answered with unwavering confidence, and he said to them, you are mistaken, planao in Greek. You have wandered away from the truth, as do all false teachers. You have deceived yourselves. You've lost touch with reality, not understanding the scriptures at all. Because you do not know God, you do not know the word of God. You don't have an accurate understanding of him. So you fail to recognize the power of God, dunamis in Greek, his might, his ability. He can do all things, can he? So he certainly could raise the dead if he wanted to, couldn't he? He created man from the dust of the earth. Well, certainly he can raise that dust back to life again, if he so chooses. He created the universe. Well, then why can he not create new life in eternity? Life that is unlike anything else on this earth. Is anything too difficult for him? So, here is your error, Jesus tells him in verse 30. In the resurrection... Those who will inherit eternal life, life in heaven, neither marry nor are they given in marriage. Now, that's the error, the error of the Pharisees as well. That is a relationship that has been ordained by God for those who are on this earth, not for those who are in heaven. But instead, Jesus says, all of those who are in heaven will be in perfect harmony. 
They will be in perfect fellowship, in perfect unity with each other, equally glorified, just like the angels in heaven. And the angels neither increase or decrease in number, do they? No, they never die. And so there is no longer a need for marriage, for more children to be born. So it will be with the sons of God, with the daughters of God. We will no longer have an earthly body. We will no longer have a natural body, but we will have a body that has been created by God for eternity, a spiritual body. And so we shall bear the image of the heavenly. But regarding the truth of the resurrection of the dead, Jesus continues in verse 31, have you not read that which was spoken to you by God through Moses in Exodus chapter 3, verse 6. When God spoke to Moses in that burning bush, you recall that, don't you? And he said this to Moses. I'm sure they could quote it. He said, I am the God of Abraham. I'm the God of Isaac. I am the God of Jacob. Did you notice what he said? Did you notice he used the present tense? Well, they had all died. And yet God refers to them as if they still lived, as if he was still their God. Well, then they must be alive because God is not the God of the dead, is he? But he's the God of the living. They are alive in the glory of heaven, in his glorious presence, worshiping him. And the dead don't worship God, do they? Well, but in addition to that, think of this. While these men were on this earth, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the patriarchs of the nation of Israel, God made promises to them. But the promises that he made to them, some of those promises were never fulfilled. Well, since God cannot lie, they must be alive and resurrected from the dead so that he can fulfill those promises to them. And then there was silence. And when the multitude of people who who were there in the temple courtyard that day, we're told, heard this. It says in verse 33, they were astonished. Ekpleso in Greek. They were struck in the head. They were amazed. They were amazed by what Jesus had said, by his wisdom, by his insight into the scriptures. Oh, and the Sadducees? Well, they were devastated. Because Jesus had accomplished what no scribe, what no Pharisee had ever accomplished. He had silenced the Sadducees by his teaching. And we're told that even the enemies of Jesus recognized what he had done. Luke 20, verse 39, it says that some of the scribes said to him, Teacher, you have spoken well. I hope they were taking notes. Well, even though... They said he had spoken well. We're not told that any of them ever turned to him for the salvation of their souls. That's sad, isn't it? But for those of us who belong to Christ, the resurrection is a reassuring reality. The sin, the sorrow, the suffering that are part of this life, the tears, will all be wiped away and God will transform us. He will transform us in holy perfection and we will experience unending joy in his presence forever. Glory to his name. Amen. You've been 
been listening to Bruce David Bell, pastor of Berean Bible Fellowship. If the Lord has ministered to you through this message and you would like more information, then visit us on the web at bbfva.org.